I'm Enrique Cerna. Next on Conversations, Peter Buffett. He's the son of billionaire Warren Buffett, but he's made his own mark as an Emmy Award winning musician, composer, and best selling author of Life is What You Make It. His personal story of finding his own path without the wealth of his famous father. Peter Buffett, next on Conversations. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by. KCTS 9 members, and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Peter Buffett, welcome to Conversations. Thank you very much. And welcome, welcome to Seattle. <laughs> yeah. Your first time here? My first time in Seattle. I can't believe it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, your father's been here numerous times. He's been we here know that. a lot of times. Yeah. And uh, I already look forward to coming back. No. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, one of our five that we that? usually get. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks for bringing that along with you from New yeah. York City. Let's talk a little bit. As we speak, um, you're about to perform for the uh, Bellevue Community Foundation, and uh, these are the types of performances you do around the country where right. it's basically uh, kind of a, a mixture of a concert and conversation. Right, exactly. Tell me about that. Well, it, it started really with uh, me doing a few speaking engagements, really, for uh, uh, organizations like Citigroup and things. I would talk to their wealthy clients because uh, having my father as Warren Buffett, people were kind of curious. As I got older, they'd say, you know, you're Warren Buffett's son. You're so normal. And, <laughs> and I thought, well... That's nice, well, thank you. Yeah. But, but that's kind of sad, maybe too. Yeah. And and so people would have me speak on the idea of you know passing down values as opposed to money, and because uh, that was a big thing in our our household. It wasn't about the money; it was about you know how you lived your life. And uh, so I did that a few times. I started to play as I also spoke, and it became this concert and conversation. Uh, and, and what I like about it is it, it really is a conversation. I take questions throughout the whole show. So it's very dynamic. I get to hear what's on the, the minds of the audience. Um, and actually, it was that show that then someone in the audience at one point said, you know, that's a book. Hmm. That, really? You know, and so then the, the book followed that. And uh, so it's been an interesting thing now to, to do the show to support the book. You know, first it was the Right. The, the show actually came first. Yeah, and I misspoke. Actually, you were here for the Bellevue College Foundation. It's still the Bellevue Community. Yes, you're right. Yeah, Foundation. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And these are a lot of things that you do. I mean, at various places. I understand you right. may do as many as three a month or, yeah, or, or, or a week. more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's been a, up to three a week. I'm actually doing three uh, this week and the next. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Because my life sort of worked in reverse. When I started in music, I was doing it pragmatically. I wanted. I had to make a living. Right. And so it was commercials and film and television, these things where you're in a room, for me, pretty much by myself doing this stuff. And so to now be out touring and playing, uh, usually you do that when you're 20 <laughs> and, right. and you do the, the pragmatic stuff later, but mine's flipped around. So uh, I've been doing it a lot. I really enjoy it. I, we've done it in small towns like McCook, Nebraska, population uh, 8,000, I think, uh, all the way you know, to colleges and places like the, here at, at Bellevue in Seattle. Um, uh, China, yeah, really yeah. a lot of places. It's been really fun. Well, let's talk about what you talk about and and the and the book as well, because I mean, your father very prominent, obviously very wealthy, but he made it very clear to you and your two siblings right. that uh, yeah, he was going to be there for you and uh, you know probably help you some degree financially, but that $37 billion that he's earned over the right, years, yeah. actually it's gone to the Gates Foundation yeah, exactly. across it's the streets here. Yeah, it's gone around the corner, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and we never, it's funny, when we grew up, we didn't see the money. We didn't really know what he did, and we really didn't, really? 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 You didn't yeah, know what no, he did? No, honestly. In fact, there's a funny story. Uh, you know, we all had to fill out what our parents did in grade school on some form, and uh, the the term for what my dad did, or certainly one of them, was security analyst, right? So my sister writes that on her form, 
and everybody thought he checked alarm systems <laughs> <laughs> because they, nobody knew what that meant. I didn't know what it meant. And, you know, so uh, the, the display of wealth uh, was never there. I mean, we grew up in this typical Midwestern house household where uh, my dad still lives. You know, I go home and I sleep in my bedroom and uh, walk to public school, went to public school our whole childhood through high school. I had the same English teacher my mother had, you know, just classic Midwestern upbringing. And so we never really even thought about the idea of, gee, we have money and what's going to happen? You know, are we going to get some? I mean, none of that stuff really entered our mind. And did, did and, your parents and your father did they really want to make your childhood, you grew up in Nebraska and Omaha there, as normal as possible, yeah. even though he was having all these this tremendous financial success? Yep, and I think it was truly who they were at their core. So I don't think, in fact, they even thought we should do this for the sake of the kids. It's that this is who we are. This is how we're going to live. Now, it will be also for the sake of the kids. But it wasn't, I don't think it was heavily a conscious decision as much as just this is who we are. We're not about the money. It's the fact that my dad loves what he does. That's That's what he's doing every day. And that's what we picked up on. We picked up on this idea that here's this guy. We're not sure what he does, but he sure seems to like it a lot. <laughs> and everybody seems happy. We got food on the table. We got a roof over our heads. We didn't need more than that. And, you know, we were able to take a vacation or whatever, but it was never, uh, there was never an extravagant lifestyle. Uh, and again, mostly because my parents didn't need that to feel whole. Uh, and they just didn't think it was the, the, the point, you know, that the money was sort of an accident in the sense that my dad just happened to be good at something that happened to make a lot of money, but he'd do it even if it didn't make a lot of money. He always had a pretty good sense of humor in saying that, uh, what was it that you guys won the, uh, ovarian uh, lottery, ovarian <laughs> lottery. Yes, exactly. Yeah. He felt he won it because he was born at a time and place where he could do what he loves. And certainly we felt we won it because here we have these great parents, great community, great upbringing. And, and yes, you know, even though there might be a pile of money, the real point is we've got a loving household and we don't have to think about the money in terms of having food and shelter and all the basics. So did, did he simple. ever sit the three of you down and say, OK, listen, so this is how it's going to be when it comes to dispersing my wealth? I don't remember that, to tell you the truth, although it's hard to believe it didn't happen at some point in a dinner table conversation or something, maybe when we were a little bit older over a holiday thing or something. I, I can't imagine that that conversation didn't happen. It happened in a sense, in a letter, because when we were all, I think it was 19, uh, my grandfather had left all of us a farm, and my dad sold that farm and invested it in Berkshire Hathaway, his company. Uh, and so we all got 600 shares, which is now a, a big fortune. But at the time, it was a very, very small fortune. It was $90,000 when I got it. In that letter, when he said, this is what you've got, there was some sense of this is it and this is all you're going to get so use it wisely you know that kind of thing I don't exactly know how it was phrased but there was certainly a moment in time when I thought okay I better better use this wisely I better make the most of it and did all three of you pretty much feel along the same lines about you know this is what we got yeah. and it's it's pretty good <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's nothing yeah. to sneeze at no exactly and and we did i will say also and i don't know specifically with my brother how this worked but my sister's got a pretty famous story that's been written up and i remember a time in my own life where in our 20s or 30s it's like you know my sister in particular she was living in washington uh, she was pregnant, I think, with her first child, and they wanted to redo their kitchen. They had a very, very small kitchen. And so she went to my dad to ask for a loan. She didn't ask for them, you know, she didn't say, Dad, will you just give me the money? And he said, no, you should go to the bank. You know, that's what people do. And and I had a similar situation. I don't remember exact details. So I think we probably all asked once. <laughs> and we learned. And the truth is what we really learned is we did go to the bank. We did get the loan. We did get the work done. And then you go, you know what, I can do this. I'm capable of it. It makes me feel like I've done it my, on my own. And it's a way better feeling than somebody writing a check. What have you learned out of all of this um, and the values that, I guess, been passed down? 
Well, there's certainly multiple values. One, I like to say, you know, in a sentence, it's self-respect comes from earning your own reward. You can't really, if somebody's always sort of taking care of things for you in one way or another, you're never sure if you could actually do it yourself. So the idea that you, your experiences are really what makes you you, uh, to allow for those experiences as opposed to every time you fall down, oh, here's a crutch, here, I'll help you up, whatever. You never know if you can really get up. So fundamentally from the kind of monetary kind of the, the that classic perspective of having a, a wealthy parent and and a kid that that you know doesn't just get it handed to him that's the greatest lesson for sure uh, in terms of of lessons from my parents otherwise it's been this idea of watching my dad love what he does you know i mean that i i saw that every day and so that was my uh, little clue to what life could be you know if if you have a father or a mother who comes home and hates their jobs mm. and you know and you got to forget about the day well then that's what you're going to think being an adult is is oh i maybe i have to not like my work in order to be you know kind of in in the world that i'm familiar with and and i never saw that and that's always the challenge to find that thing that's going to be the passion in your life absolutely yeah. and it doesn't always come you know wrapped neatly in a bow mm -hmm. <laughs> for sure uh you you know i while it was music for me of course music isn't the easiest thing to make a living at so i had to find my way through and, and figure out a way to do that uh and then i remind people you know somebody might want to be a dancer and realize maybe they're not the best dancer or maybe dancing isn't very pragmatic in terms of the life of the the career that sort of thing but you go off to school you get an accounting degree and you're an accountant for a dance company or something you know you can be around the thing you love you can mm -hmm. help support it and and help it run every day and you know that can be maybe not just as fulfilling but at least you get it every day you get a little taste of it so there's Let, other ways let's talk about you becoming a musician because as you say that's Probably not the easiest world to eventually, you know, find great success, and you've done right. that as an Emmy award-winning yeah, songwriter, composer. You've done some music of Kevin Costner, Dance with the Wolves, right. commercials, all these things. I, I, but where did you fail? Did you fail? Well, even with Dances with Wolves, uh, it could be considered a failure of sorts because that was a big dream to get into film and television after uh, ten years of doing commercials. Uh, which was its own, you know, successes and failures. I mean, you can work on a commercial and think you've done this brilliant job and the client walks in and says, it's all wrong, and you go, okay, and you know, like get right in there and start again. But with Dances with Wolves, Kevin actually heard my music and asked me to score the whole film. He said, I love your stuff, I want you to score the film. I was totally not prepared for yeah. that. I had dreamed of getting into film, but I thought it would be incremental. I didn't realize my first film uh, would be, you know, that request. And uh, he was a first-time filmmaker at the time. He had never directed before. This was a, a three-hour film about the American Indian, subtitled. You know, people thought he was crazy. So a combination of things happened, basically, where it was like, you know, Good for you, Kevin, that you want this guy to score your film, but he's never done it before. There's no way we're going to let you do it, you know, the investors in the film and that sort of thing. And and they were right to, to pull back, and I ended up scoring a scene, which I was, th that was perfect. You know, mm -hmm. that worked out well. But, you know, if you step back and look at what was presented to me, that was actually, you know, a failure on my part in terms of what, what could have been. You got on the ground level of MTV, Yes. Tell me about that. Those are the kinds of things where, uh, boy, if I can speak to kids about starting out in the world, you just put yourself out there and do everything that's even slightly related to the thing you want to do, which is what I was doing for a couple of years in San Francisco. How did that all come about? Well, I was out, uh, the MTV in particular, I was out washing my car, and I had just moved into a new place, and my neighbor was out front, and he asked me what I did, and I said, I write music for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you should meet my son-in-law. He does these little animated things, and, and they're always needing music for this or that. And I met him, this was 1981, and he said, sure enough, you know, I'm, we're doing these crazy little 10-second station IDs for this music channel. Uh, nobody would really heard of cable in 1981, and certainly not a music channel. Uh, but I got paid $1,000 for 10 seconds of music, and that sounded really good. <laughs> so I did a bunch of those, and it was MTV. 
And, and so again, all I'm doing is trying to get the work and trying to do my best at every job. And then every once in a while, something would come along where it wasn't just a job. It was a whole shift in, in direction. And, and the beauty of getting into commercials then after that was everybody wanted to look and sound like MTV because it was the hippest thing happening at the, at the right. moment. So that sort of just led the way to all sorts of work. Has there been a challenge being the son of Warren Buffett? You know, not really. I, it's interesting because that, that the assumption, of course, is here's this guy with this big shadow. And and my my best way to describe it really is that he moved out of the way very early on. So that shadow was never cast. I mean, it, it's amazing. I, uh, and there's a couple of reasons why. Nobody really knew who he was for a really <laughs> long time. They knew Jimmy Buffett. And, in fact, most people thought I was related to Jimmy Buffett <laughs> because, you know, it's music and all right. that. So forever people would ask, are you related to Jimmy Buffett? Somebody just asked me that yesterday, actually. And, <laughs> and uh, so there wasn't the, the shadow that people now see uh, then I at all. What if it helped, too, that he was based in Omaha in the sure. Midwest? Yep. He was, yeah. he was in Omaha. The stock market wasn't really sexy. I mean, all that stuff happened later. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, he started to get on the radar of a lot more people. It, just, it basically came off the financial pages and into kind of daily news and daily life. And so... By then, I was an established person in my own right. So I really, it, it was only kind of quirky and kind of funny. I mean, again, my, my mom and I used to laugh about, look at all this stuff that's going on, and we're still just us, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it never was. And then my wife and I moved to New York in 2005. And quite honestly, that's the first time when I went, whoa, this is weird being mm -hmm. his son, because there is the financial capital of the world, uh, and it starts to become... Are you related to Warren? And uh, and again, by that time, I'm an adult and I've had my own accomplishments and it's not a big deal. If I had moved to New York in my 20s and it was th this decade or something, I would it would not be fun. That would be complicated. Was it always your mission, though, and maybe his as well, to, that, that you needed to do things yourself, for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, he encouraged it greatly because th he knew what it felt like to have your own success. And after Dances with Wolves in particular, I remember calling him and saying, wow, there's nothing like success. <laughs> Everything starts to change, and it's great. So it felt so good to have those accomplishments in different ways throughout my career. Uh, and he loved it, of course, because uh, any parent wants their child to be successful on their own and, and make their own way. And so he certainly encouraged it. Uh, luckily, I was able to taste some of that and, and recognize how good that felt. And uh, so there's never been that classic struggle, you know, really between father and son at all. And in fact, when I was in my 20s and establishing myself, uh, I was home visiting uh, one time, and he was in the kitchen heading off to work, and, and he said to me, uh, you know, Pete, you and I kind of do the same thing. I'm off to go to Berkshire and paint on my canvas a little bit, and you do your music. And I thought, what a gift just to have the, the father compare themselves to the son. You know, I mean, usually it's a constant struggle uh -huh. the other way, and that was really... Uh, very meaningful exchange. I'm not sure he would even remember it because he was just like <laughs> commenting on it. But, but to a kid, it's like, wow, this is great. Yeah. When you had your first big taste of success, did he give you any advice about how to handle it? No, I don't think he this did. is not his Actually, style. No, it is not his style, and that's interesting because even my finances, he doesn't give oh, really? advice on how to handle Say, it. Say, Dad, how I mean, should I do this? Yeah, I mean, if I asked, he would give some thoughts, but basically, he is just like his management style with his companies. He's very hands off. He's very much. You can do it. I believe in you. It's it's a great show of respect. Actually, you know, some people think, oh, we didn't give you money. He didn't give you this or that that seems kind of harsh. And it's like, no, actually, I take it as real love and respect. It's like, no, I believe in you. You can do this. You've been quoted as saying that you're glad you don't have your father's mind. Yeah. Oh, I mean, what would I do with it, first of all? <laughs> and, and again, going back to that $90,000, you know, if I didn't do anything with that money at all, I'd have something like $70 million or more today. And it's very fun for me to talk about it in the book and the show because 
you know, I, I say I am a living example, living proof of what I would call your money or your life. You know, mm -hmm. I would much rather have my life than this pile of money that somebody else made. Because again, I'd never know if I could do it. And, and I can say absolutely that it's way better to have the life that I built myself, you know, than just a pile of money that's, that's somebody else's. In the performances you do, and you know, you're, you're talking to folks about what's in the book and kind of your own values and the values you've received from your father. But I'm curious, what do you tend to hear from the audience? Because you right. take questions from them. Right. And, and is there one particular theme or question that always comes up that... Well, it, it depends to some extent whether I'm talking to students, like college students, even high school. So, and, and that's more about the how did you get started, uh, you know, and how, how was it getting, you know, into music, that sort of thing. So it's more about how do you find your path, how do you make your own way. Those are kind of the thematic components of those questions. Uh, when it's a philanthropic group, it often tends to, to gear towards more the philanthropic work, because I talk about that as well, experiences in the field, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's always parents or children, of course, in both those groups peppered around. And there it really is about the, the parent-child dynamic and some of the things we're talking about here. So it shifts depending on, on the audience. So you have twin daughters. Right. So what's been the dynamic that you've had with them and also when it comes to money itself. Right. Well, I've learned how hard it is <laughs> when you love your children to say, now I'm doing this because I love you when it comes to money. And and the saving grace for me, and I think it's happening actually with others because I've talked to kids whose parents have had the book, or, mm -hmm. and is that I know from my own feelings and experience what it really does feel like to support without uh, you know, just giving it over and, and, and feeling like the only way you can really help somebody is to give money. And it's absolutely not true. And so I've had very difficult discussions at times with my kids around that idea. But I, you know, but they're extremely real and authentic because, again, I'm coming from a place of true knowledge. At the same time, I've wanted to give them a little bit of help because I know I got a little bit of help and I know how valuable that is. So I've try to do things where it's, you know, as my dad says, enough to do anything, but not enough to do nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, really try and help out when I feel like it's it's a catalyst to something they really are going to move into. Uh, but there have been times uh, when I've said no, and it's it's hard. I, again, I've learned how hard that is. <laughs> One of the things that uh, your father has provided money for, for you and your siblings, is for... Uh, foundation work. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me about the no, is it no, Novo. Novo. Yeah, foundation. Novo. What does that stand for? Actually? That is Latin for to change, alter, or invent, which, you know, my default thing when I'm looking for a name is I go to Latin. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I took it in ninth grade. It's never left me for some reason. Um, but uh, it, that was a huge gift, responsibility, opportunity, all those things. When my dad decided, you know, we knew he was always going to give his money away. What we didn't know is it was going to happen while he was still alive and that uh, it was going to, you know, involve us so greatly. So in 1999, actually, my parents started that process with a smaller gift of a uh, foundation. And that grew and grew until then in 2006, his big announcement, uh, where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got a huge... A uh, chunk of money, and then uh, as well, my sister, brother, and myself got a billion dollar pledge, and that's been an awesome responsibility. Now, did each of you have foundations that you would handle, or is it all part of one big foundation? All separate. So, all my separate. sister has hers, brothers, and, and mine. Now, tell yeah. me where the focus of this foundation. Who's being helped? And, and I'd also like to know the, the other siblings, what they do. Sure, yeah. So, ours, and I say ours, my wife Jennifer and I have really set this strategy together and she's there as president running it day to day which is great because i'm out doing other right. things including advocating for our work uh, at the foundation we really came down to a, sort of a simple premise which is the world is out of balance and it has been growingly so for really thousands of years as it takes on a more domination and exploitation frame you know where it's sort of whatever you've got, if I need it, I'm going to take it, and you're not as important as my needs kind of thing. On a national level, cultural level, however you might look at it, uh, it's very power over. 
And we're saying, how can we change that to power with and ways of collaboration and nurturing and, you know, what I would consider to be, frankly, more feminine qualities, which mm -hmm. is not to say more female qualities, because we all have all these qualities in us. But how can we balance out the world a little more? And and we did, in fact, realize that supporting girls and women was probably one of the strongest ways to, to change a lot of behavior. And, and uh, it hits the environment. It helps health, poverty, education. Instead of going down these kind of vertical tracks, we knew that women and girls would be a much more horizontal way to approach all sorts of issues. Uh, so that's the main focus. And then we have a couple of small things that feed into that around education and local economies and things like that. Uh, and how about your siblings? Important. What do they do? Uh, my brother, uh, he's been farming pretty much all his life. Mm -hmm. And so he's, of course, very knowledgeable around agriculture and also goes to poverty-stricken areas, mostly in the developing world, but, but around the world, uh, to help with agricultural work, uh, things around water, uh, and some other issues as well that are tied into that. But that's his big focus. And my sister, who's in Omaha, uh, has really mostly focused on education and early childhood education in particular. Seeing Omaha as a place, although there's national initiatives she's working on as well, Omaha is a great incubator. She knows it well. The public school system is still intact. She can work inside of that and learn things and then scale things if it's necessary. Uh, but Omaha is really her focus. Uh, but as a reflection of a lot more of the country and, and ultimately probably the world as well. Mm. Well, the book is called Life is What You Make It, and Peter Buffett is doing just that. Find the, <laughs> your own path to fulfillment, New York Times bestseller when it came out. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoyable. Absolutely. Thank have you. Good, have a good time here. I will. All Thanks. right. Thank it's you very great much. Great to see you. All yeah, right. Thank you. Ain't she sweet? You're walking in down the street. Local production and broadcast of Conversations at KCTS 9 is made possible in part by KCTS 9 members and by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.